Welcome, Salome Thomas L. How you doing, my friend? I'm great, man. It's great, great to be here with you, Jimmy. It's great to be here. Summertime, you know, we should be relaxing, but as you know, leader, as you say, leadership always. So always on point. So I appreciate being on this journey with you. I appreciate it, buddy. Here, I have to ask you, man. You know, I just recently had a chance to break some bread with you in Kansas City at Jack Stack Barbecue. And my question is this, Salam, how do you always just keep looking so good? Talk to me about just tell me a little bit about this little regime, this fitness regime, because I see you on social media all the time, showing yourself, looking how good you look. Talk to us a little bit about that, buddy. Well, you know what it is, Jimmy, is um, I actually stole some secrets from my staff in the staff lounge. I actually made a video and talked about this, how, you know, I would just kind of hang around. You know, a lot of people talk about how the, the negativities in the staff lounge, but they also, ladies talk about their beauty secrets. Oh. And so I would often steal, and they, they often talk about like face scrubs. So I make sure I use face scrubs. You know, they talk about, um, you know, making sure that they're working out and doing their cardio. So I just would steal little nuggets from my staff and, and try to um, try to take care of myself. Because as you know, we're no good to other people. If we're leadership is about service, if we're serving others, we've got to take care you know, of, of, of ourselves. And I just want to say I'm honored that you're interviewing me because I know that you had, you were tight on your slots and you were thinking about Tom Murray. And, um, and then it came down to sort of like a, a, a toss up question um, on sports and Tom thought quarterback was a refund. So I was That's able right. to win out. So, you know, I'm just, I'm just thankful that, that, that I, I, I won the slot and I'm here, man, but you know, blessing, honored to, to be able to, uh, 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 you know, lead and take care of myself. I do try to run and lift three to four times a week. I try to eat healthy. When you had me out eating that barbecue, I had to let it all go. Uh, Jimmy. <laughs> For the most part, I try to eat lots of protein and veggies and every now and then make sure you know, I, I I enjoy myself for sure. Good for you, buddy. Hey, you know what I'm already excited about? I can't wait to show that little clip to Tom Murray. I'll show him that. <laughs> Make sure I take care of him as well. I know, so. that's, I know that's your guy, you know. That's <laughs> right. Well, hey, Salome, we got a, just a few questions for you today. We want our audience to hear from you today. So we're going to get right into it. So, Salome, if you don't mind, take our audience on a journey and tell us how you ended up being a school leader, my friend. Um. Jimmy, I, uh, you know, I grew up in the inner city of Philadelphia and um, attended public schools. Um, my mother, you know, was a struggling parent, raising six boys. And uh, so my teachers were really, you know, our support system, my teachers and coaches. And um, and so when I graduated high school and college, I started working in television. My teacher said, why don't you come in? And I was working in sports television, said, come talk to our kids in career day in high school. And, you know, high school folks always have ulterior motives. Come talk to them about your job. And some kids in the audience said, you know, listen, if these teachers supported you, how come you aren't a teacher? It was the first time I really thought about that. Like, why, you know, you know, my, why, why hadn't I chosen the path of those who basically were saving me, saving Private Ryan every day? And um, I quit my TV job and got a master's degree and started teaching. Came back two years later, started teaching in the same high school. And some of those kids ran up to me and I thought they say, welcome back, Mr. L. They said, you know, um, we, you were a fool to leave that TV job. We were hoping you would help us get a job when we graduate. You know, high school kids can be very concrete, you know. But, I mean, you know, you're a high school principal. Yeah. Um, but they also, Jimmy, can make you feel like you walk on water, you know. And uh, But I, I realized that working in a high school, that um, high school reform does not begin in high school. That many children enter high school who struggled in elementary and middle school. And so I spent the next 10 years of my life in a feeder middle school and in 10 years in our community, we lost almost 20 young people to murder in our community. And I, and I said, I've got to find a way to, to reach these kids, to teach them that they can choose the behavior, but they can't choose the consequences. And that's when I started teaching kids to play chess. I started teaching special education students first, teaching mathematics on the chess boards. And then all the kids started to play and then they all started beating me, beating the other teachers. Then they started beating other schools, other middle schools, high schools. Then Arnold Schwarzenegger came to visit our school. One of my girls checked me to Arnold. Arnold said, you terminated the Terminator. You know, and then Arnold said, when are you going to write a book? And that's how I ended up writing I Choose to Stay. You know, I said, I write the book, you write the forward. And then Arnold actually wrote the forward and I Choose to Stay. And, um, and I said, you know, I want a school where all of my kids must play chess. And I became a principal 
at a at an elementary school one block from my middle school. So now I had kids playing chess in grades K to eight, and um and that was my beginning. Nineteen ninety nine. Wow. My first year's principal, man, and I'll never, you know, I'll never forget. I, you know, I was like, I, I could be selling used cars right now because this leadership <laughs> is for the birds, you know. But every year you get better. Every struggle makes you stronger, and then you just meet so many wonderful staff members, you know, and kids. And I, I'm 22 years in, yeah. you know, on this um on this journey, Jimmy, and I'm and I'm not not looking back. Not no no hesitations, no reservations, no regrets. Good for you. 22 years in. Oh my God. That's exactly where I ended 22 years at it, buddy. And yeah. you're right. The, the, the role of the leadership or any role of any uh, role in education is so challenging, right? Because the variable is always changing, right? When you're working with kids, you're working with, you know, even adults, we're unpredictable. We're unpredictable. And that's, that we're... that's the challenge. When I wanted to become a teacher, my mom said, best job you could have, but best decision. Just remember every teacher is not a parent, but every parent is a teacher. Right. I mean, when I wanted to become a principal, my mother said, have you lost your mind? I said, Mom, <laughs> you? She said, you know, my mother was a paraprofessional in our school district. She said, why do you want to supervise adults? I said, I'm tired of breaking up fights in the cafeteria in my classroom. She said, as a principal, you will break up more fights between teachers than you ever <laughs> had, you know, in the classroom. She said, but if you're going to be successful, remember that arrogance is the Achilles heel of the school leader. She said, the school principal, go in and bow down to those old ladies They've been there for principal after principal after principal. And I I've held on. And my mom passed away in in in, in uh, uh 2002, Jimmy. And I've never, never, ever forgotten, you know, those words from her, you know, how important it is to know that as a leader, we serve. You know, and if mm -hmm. service is beneath you, leadership will always be beyond you. And I think that's the one thing that's kept me alive. And, you know, I wake up every morning with determination, go to bed every night with satisfaction. Because I never forgot those words from my mom. Who you know, and I know you're real close to your mom too. You learn yeah. a lot, mom. So you know, it's nothing like the relationship between a mother and a son. Yeah. Um, but my mother taught me, man, serve, serve, serve. No one is ever beneath you. And as yeah. long as the staff knows that, you know, as long as the people, even the audience, you know, we speak to audiences of thousands of people. Mm -hmm. Those people in the audience, they know, they they can feel your heart and know that you're speaking to them from your heart. You to their they receive it and they take it, you know, other places. Yeah. What a blessing, man. When you share that with your mom, just now just touches my heart because I know how important our mamas are to us, the lessons they teach us. So we try to carry those forward. And and the fact that your mama was a paraeducator, my mama was a paraeducator, my mom was also a cook uh in the school cafeteria. And uh, my mom retired as a paraeducator. So that's awesome wow. that we share that in common, my friends. So yeah. All right. my, mom, my, my, my mom didn't cook in the cafeteria. Let me tell you what my mom did. I was trying to get some kids to come to Saturday school because they were struggling during the week. This is my early years as a teacher. Mm -hmm. So the kids wouldn't show up on Saturday. So I told my mom, if if you, if you would you cook if I invite them? I said, because they'll come if you cook. So she started cooking in the house. The kids never missed a Saturday. Jimmy came every <laughs> and, and two of those kids in my Saturday program have master's degrees and are now uh, 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 educators. They were at this was at these struggling kids, right, uh -huh. in, a, in a struggling community. But I knew if I could get them, you know, just more time with them. And my mom said, "I'll cook." You know, my mom's a good cook. You know, you know my mom. They they cook it up, right? Yeah. So, um, and 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 the kids still talk about it today. How they because it's something about cooking a meal, you know, for your son, for your son's friends, and you know, for you, know, and then for the students. At, you yeah. know, as you know, your mom was a cook in the cafeteria. When, they, when those children will never forget those those cat the lunch ladies they call them you know yeah yeah my mama cooked for my students a couple times but she also would regularly cook for our staff she would actually come to the school and cook and uh, wow. we would use the family consumer science room and we'd get everything ready my mom and dad would come up she'd had everything ready people would just come through the line and just get uh, the latest of mama casas and so it's always some good memories so I hear from teachers every now and then. Those were the good old days. So that's, she's spoiled you, man. an angel, she's right? Spoiled. She's an angel. That's right. That's the only reason I made it as long as I did, Salom. <laughs> they didn't really care about me. They just want to know, is mama coming to cook for us again? So Nothing like a good mom. little method to my madness there, my friend. So, right. hey, listen, Salom. So talk to us a little bit. Can you share a challenge you faced during your career that made you question whether or not you could continue doing the work as a school leader, because we know the challenges that come with it, right? Any role in education, but talk specifically about the role of the principalship and the challenges that you may have faced that 
made you question, right? Because I think we all do at some point, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. And and lately, more often than ever, you know, these last few years have been rough on us teachers, school leaders, you know, anybody you know who's working with young people. But yeah, about five years ago, Jimmy, I um I was struggling with the fact that my teachers were really underpaid. And um, and I really was campaigning my board and the other folks in the state to really raise teacher pay. Um, and more specifically, you know, at, at, at our school. And um, and my board um was not supportive of it to the point, Jimmy, where they basically tried to fire me because they didn't want, they felt that I was betraying them by advocating for, for my teacher. They said, we hired you, you advocate for us. You advocate for why their salaries are okay, not for why they deserve you no know, more money. And um, and I, I got a call one day, listen, the board, matter of fact, I think we were together, Jimmy. When this <laughs> we, were. we were. We were together when this happened. I'm like, yo, what's, and you know, they bought the police. Like we, were, we were in Kansas City. Right. Yes. Yeah, right. we're in Kansas City. <laughs> what is it about Kansas City, man? <laughs> but um, but um, they had brought the police in, changed the locks on the doors, and made it seem like I had done something wrong or whatever. And um, I just didn't know what like where it was going to go, you know, from from there. But my my staff basically they they met with my staff and just said, you know, you know, we're investigating Principal Well. And my staff said, what did he do wrong? Because they, they knew I've been advocating for high pay for him. Mm -hmm. We can't tell you what he did wrong. And and um, and they told me, you know, turn in your computer, turn in your keys. And, and my staff said, well, if he's not working here, we're not coming to work. We're taking off. We're, we're walking out tomorrow. And they my board told my staff, you walk out, you're going to get fired. The next day, 30 staff members stay home. Now, I have 60 staff. 30 came to work to somebody had to be there to let the kids know what was going on. Right. Because they're mm -hmm. going to be wondering what's happening. But. Um, but that that touched me more than these people put their job. And, and some of these folks that I heard were advocating for me were people who, you know, I had been in some battles with his staff members. You know, <laughs> you know, and, you know as, a, as, a, as an administrator, as a supervisor, you know, you're not, you're not always the person that people, you know, you, you, know you, get, you get kicked, you get talked about, you get laughed at, you get rejected. That's what leadership is. But in, in the heat of the moment, the people knew that I even when I was trying to improve them. It was always about the kids. And when the battle came, they fought, you know, for me. And um, the governor got involved and five board members ended up resigning. And I was able to keep my job. The, the uh, teachers got a raise. The administrators, they were happy because they got a raise of byproduct. They got a raise, um, you know, the parents, everybody, you know. Um, but but for me, I was like, wow, my board can do that to me? Like, just. Is this really, you know, and my kids at home was a struggle for me because my daughters were like, Dad, you shouldn't go work at that school. They don't appreciate you. But you know what I had to explain to them, Jimmy? You know, that might be true. But you know what? The school is not those folks who were trying to get rid of me. Mm -hmm. The school is the people who put their jobs on the line for me. Mm -hmm. Those teachers who who fought for me. Who I said, when I don't go back, you know, because I was getting calls from superintendents everywhere after that, like, come take over. You know, you, when I don't go back. I, I, I turned my back on those people who put them their jobs on the line for me. And my, yeah. my kids understood and I went back. But it really made me question, Jimmy, like, who are we really serving out here? Because if we're not taking care of these teachers, because they're taking care of our children. And that's why so many are leaving the profession now, because mm -hmm. the system just has not been good, you know, to uh to to our teachers. But I also, you know, met, you know, met with my administrative team and we all I mean it was they told me they said, listen, there were some days because it was a couple of days, you know, they had me locked out of the yeah. building. Um, and they just said it was a lot of crying, a lot of soul searching. And many of them said, I, I really found, I found my why with all of this, you know, mm -hmm. going on. I really found out that this is the true test of leadership. Like, is this battle, you know, really, you know, really worth it? But I also saw that, you know, we, we, sometimes we don't understand what are the, you know, how do we benefit from always fighting and champion and being a champion for yeah. others. But it's because people watch and learn from us. So when that when their moment comes, they're ready to fight. They're ready, and 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 they and they fall from people. Said that was lean on me, twenty seventeen. You know, like the new <laughs> Joe, Joe Clark. Clark, Joe Clark. Right. But um, but I, I but it just, it just made us all stronger 
and we came, my staff printed up shirts. We are family. It was amazing how we all came together after that, mm -hmm. you no know, stronger, but it did make me question the system. And I kind of knew that today that this was coming back then because I saw that we really, we're really not taking care of the people who are serving yeah. our children. People working in schools need to be treated a lot better. And if we don't do something quickly, it's only going to get worse. Yeah. That's why I always say, right? Leadership isn't about how we behave or respond when we know what to do. It's how we behave and respond when we don't know what to do. And I remember watching that day, and I know you didn't share this, but I was there. So I, I observed and witnessed some of it. And it wasn't just the teachers that were advocating for you. It was your families. They were right. reaching out and they were supporting, they were advocating, they were putting calls in. I remember that, right? Yeah, so, listen, I'm telling you, there was a parent. Uh, it was it was good stuff, buddy. It was good stuff. It's, uh, it it's a reminder that people who feel valued and appreciated will always give more than what is expected. And that's why you continue to do more and give more because you do feel valued and appreciated by your school community. So, yeah, so yeah. Salam, if you could go back though, to uh, go back and do one thing differently in your career that you think would lead to a better outcome, what would that be? What would you go back and do differently? Think you'd get a better result? Better result. I, you know, I'm telling you, I don't, um, I don't, um, I don't, I don't think there's anything that I could have done differently. There, I mean, there are plenty of mistakes I made. I'll tell you one of the things that I, you know, when I became a principal elementary principal, I wanted to convert my school into a K-8 building. And um, we were a K-5 school. And um, and all the researchers out there, students in K-8, middle school students in K-8 buildings, fewer suspensions, um, uh, higher grades, uh, better attendance in K-8 buildings than in middle school buildings. Um, so I wanted to convert you know, our school. So we added a grade every year. But what I didn't do is I didn't get the input of my staff. Many elementary teachers are intimidated by middle school kids. They're the same kids we had in as four, five, six, seven, eight year olds. They're just bigger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, but I started this transition and didn't. And, you know, they kind of sort of told me how they felt, but I didn't give them a chance to really share their fears. And um and, and once I finally saw and, and realized that their resistance wasn't me, the resistance was change. Mm -hmm. Once I was comfortable with that, then I was able to say, listen, tell me why you're resisting the change. What's what are, what are your fears? And they talked about how these students are older and that they're, they're bigger. But I talked to them about how many of us, our own children, because a large number of teachers and administrators in public schools have their kids in either private or parochial schools. Many of those schools are K-8 buildings in elementary school. Mm -hmm. So, and, all, and many of them shared how their children, their own children were in K-8 buildings. So they knew the value of it. So I said, we all know it's important. So we just need to, let's make sure that we stay close to the children. That, let's, let me get you the professional development you need to deal with adolescents. Mm -hmm. So if I could have done it over again, I would have started from ground zero had the staff input, buy-in, part of the planning, the whole nine yards. I think the transition would have been better. But here's here, here's the caveat, though. Here's I don't think I'd be the leader I am now without learning from that struggle. Yeah. There were some lessons that I learned, you yeah. know, from that. So if I had if I had done it differently, it would have been a more smoother transition because we did become a K eight, you know, building. Um, but I learned a lot and, and, and much of it was really about making sure that all stakeholders have a voice and are also making sure as leaders that we listen. Yeah, you know, that's we, a, mm -hmm. we, we listen, we tell other people, teachers, listen to your students, listen to your parents. You know, we tell parents, listen to your children, tell children, to listen. But as leaders, we need to make sure that we're listening to the people who are on the ground and many of our colleagues that are out there they're struggling some don't get it jimmy and they need our support and people you know somebody asked me in ohio recently like you know why do you go out and speak to these audiences and, and i said you know be honestly because i'm hoping that there's one administrator one leader one aspiring leader who hears me and says you know what no this job that i'm doing that i'm i'm, I'm about to embark on it's not about me it's not about having power it's really about me empowering others and so mm -hmm. if i can help if I can help some leaders out there uh, understand that, and I think that I, I will have helped the profession 
but also help the next generation of leaders. Yeah, I appreciate your honesty there in that challenge. And I think that's a challenge that many of us as leaders have faced at one point or another in our career, right? And that's why, you know, when we do this show and we talk about why it's about always about leadership, right? But it's always about leadership because there are so many different components, right, that we have to think about. And one of the things you just shared, which is a really critical point that I want our audience to remember is it wasn't, you know, you talked about how your staff resisted and so forth. Because it sounded like people knew what the right thing was to do. They knew that that would be a better result going K-8, but it was the process. And the problem with the process is they had no voice in that process. Right. And uh, you're absolutely right. So some of our own leadership failures end up be becoming part of how we grow as leaders. And those audiences you're speaking to, Salome, even if it's someone out there who's been a veteran administrator or a veteran teacher, it's just that they forget, right? It's it's not like, oh my God, this was rocket science or oh my God, I can't believe they it's just a reminder, like, why did I stop doing that? Like, I know that. It's because of the pacing of the job, the pressures of the job, uh, the 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 amount of expectations that are laid on us that to solve these problems and to fix these issues, and we're trying to do all these things and and we sometimes just kind of lose our way and we don't see it in the moment. And uh, I think that's gonna be a great reminder for our audience again. Um, is just, hey, always remember that the process would and allows other people to have a voice in that process will almost always get us a better result. So love it. So, hey, so I know we're about halfway through our little interview here. So I want to take a moment and just pause for a second, Sloan, because, you know, you mentioned this fact that you're going out and talk to audiences. Talk to us a little bit about some of your works. I know you're, a, I believe, now a three-time author. Uh, you speak all over the country. Um, and I'll be honest, I still remember the first time I heard you speak, Salome. Man, it was powerful. And it was right there in Iowa. And I took my admin team and I go, we got to go see this guy. And they're like, okay. And we go down there. And I still remember, man, you wowed them and you just lit them on fire. And, and I believe we went and had some ice cream with you, right? We even had a little ice cream there in Iowa. So talk to us about some of your works. What is the work you're doing? Take a moment here because I know sometimes we're kind of such a humble profession that we don't like to really brag on ourselves. But I want you to take a moment to say, I want you to be proud of the work that you've done, right? For your mama, for whoever. Talk to us a little about, about your work and what you're currently doing and where people can find you if they're interested in reaching out to have you come speak at their school and have you come light their staff on fire. Talk to us a little bit about that, my friend. Yeah, thanks for remembering that 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 event. And I, yes, I come to Iowa. Um, <laughs> that was actually, and believe it or not, that was a United Way event, Jimmy. Yes. Like, school district event it was a united way it was a great um it's a it great a local, and we had just opened up a convention center in fact i'm i bet if i go back and research it you were probably one of the very first events that were held in that arena it was pretty awesome beautiful facility. really yeah it was right wow. downtown we had just built it just built it it was a big deal yeah. for us yes, <laughs> a little yes, mini yes. convention center but it was pretty cool yeah and i um and and just just you know to set the record straight you said three time off i'm actually working on book number six Oh, Jimmy, this is there you go. Book. I'm way behind, buddy. I'm way behind. So share us, yeah. share us your works, your favorite of those six works. Yeah. Obviously, so the I'm first not, one, the first yeah. one I know, choose to right. stay, right? Talk a little bit about that and then where right. you're late, where you ended up now today. Right. First one is I choose to stay. Of course, it's my autobiography and story of the chess program. And also was spearheaded. I choose to stay movement because, you know, we've got thousands of people wearing these. I choose to stay shirts around the country and Africa, somebody in Korea, you know, just war one, you know, so um, Canada. Um, but 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 the follow up is the immortality of influence. Will Smith wrote the forward in, in my second book. Disney actually bought the movie rights to my first book. We we're trying to get Will to play me in the second book, but we didn't, you know, get the deal done. And then Disney kind of wanted me to leave my job and they wanted to, to own the rights to my life story. And um, I just wasn't ready for that. So um, I just kept pushing on, you know, as, as an administrator. And um, and then I've met my two co-authors, you know, TJ and Joe, who, you know, who are superintendents, mm -hmm. you know, in, um, in in Delaware. And we wrote Passionate Leadership. Uh, then we wrote Building and Winning Team, which you actually wrote the forward in that book right. for us. And then the, um, the follow up to that was Retention for Change, which is probably going to be the most powerful book that um i've written that we've worked on because it really it really is about how are we building cultures in school where teachers are knocking the door down to get in 
and not knocking the door down to get out. Same for parents mm -hmm. and same for students. And how are we how are we changing what we do, changing the system so that we can retain these folks who have you know given so much you know of themselves? I'm actually book number six I'm working on, you know, ASCD right now. I mean, that's really a book on giving kids, you know, everything that they need to be, you know, successful. But you know, as you know, I'm active on Twitter, you know, um, at principal underscore EL, um, Facebook, you know, Instagram, uh, my um, my website is principal, you know, dot com. But uh, um, real important for me is the fact that I, I get to lead a, a K-8 building you know, in, in Wilmington, Delaware, you know, high poverty community, great kids who go off to some wonderful high schools and, and colleges. And um, and I get to go out and speak to audiences about that work with mm -hmm. those young people. My work, I'm I'm 35 years, Jimmy, and I and I, I really get to talk, you know, from the heart, you know, um, from different states, uh, different countries, you know. Now with um, with the advent of the virtual, you know, presentations, you know, we can um, we can reach a large international audiences without. You know, leaving you know, leaving our homes, but it's a chance for Millie, just for me to send a message out that that t teaching teachers matter, and um, mm -hmm. they are they they are the most important thing to us in this world. I mean, the most noble profession, second to the the soldier who's out there fighting in the war for us mm -hmm. right now. You know, these teachers are really fighting some amazing battles, and I know there are many who have left the profession, and I understand why. But there are a large number who are staying, Jimmy. There are a large number of teachers and administrators yeah. who are fighting through the struggle, staying in the battle, um, and 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 helping the next generation of educators, you know, get through that, you know, that that passage. But that, you know, that's my story. And I'm I'm, you know, yeah. I um I'm I'm happy that God has blessed me to give me the ability to be able to uh to meet so many wonderful educators from all around the country and around the world, but also to be able to um, touch the lives of teachers and and students, uh, you know, in, in my school, in, in my community, and and the parents as well. Well, like you said, there are so many salam that are choosing to stay, and I'm glad that you continue to choose to stay. So, audience, if you're out there, you're looking for a person to come in and uh, share their passion, and light a fire under your staff, and give them some practical things to think about as they continue on this, we know, very challenging journey. Um, this guy is your man. Look him up at principalL.com. I promise you, you will not be disappointed. And I'm going to see you this summer, right? I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to see you in Virginia, right? That's right, buddy. I'll see yeah. you there. I'll I'm see you there. In July, just so your people know, in July, I'm going to be in uh, Austin, Texas. I'll be in, in Virginia. Um, and I'll be in Indiana as well. And in August, I'll be in Utah, Texas again kansas city ohio so if you listen uh reach out to me go to my website um love i love meeting people you know people just random i know it happens to you they just randomly like come show up and and meet you when they know that you're going to be certain places mm -hmm. and, I, and i always enjoy meeting um the amazing people who are out, out on the road out there Jimmy. well now i'm a little bummed knowing you're gonna be back in kansas city without me because i'd rather be there than, <laughs> no offense to virginia but i bet we can find some good food in virginia too so oh, we will we will all right Salam. well tell us a story Salam, about a student or a colleague who left an impression on you that you would like to give credit for helping you become a better teacher education uh educator or principal talk to us a little bit about that you know in your bio uh Salam, I did see and read uh, about a young man that you had as a student who was murdered on a street corner. Mm -hmm. And I have a feeling that that person impacted you a lot in some ways. I don't want you to feel obligated to talk about that individual. I'm sure you have many you could talk about, but that one I did see and it reminded me of some of my own former students, right? And so those are always heartbreaking in the role of a leader because one thing I always say, the one thing they can never prepare us for when we become an educator is that empty chair at graduation. No. That is something they can never prepare you for. So no. talk to us a little bit about a student who impacted you, Salam. Yeah, I often Thank say you. there's nothing like walking into a classroom and seeing an empty chair that a, a 12, 13-year-old kid will never sit in again. It's just it's amazing. You know, the story, you know, you talked about Willow, Food Bricks, one of my first chess mm -hmm. players. I'm not going to share a story because I always get emotional. As a young kid, great chess player struggled um in you know in the community but chess kept him in school and once he went to high school didn't have a program and was murdered by a younger kid but 
you're putting me on the spot because there are probably thousands of students and teachers who have impacted my um, my career. But I'll tell you one that's real relevant right now is that there's a kid that plays for the Denver Nuggets named Bones Highland. Um, he just finished his rookie season and he was second team all rookie. Um, he's in the rookie all star game. Um, was one of the top three point shooters, you know, in the league. Um, and 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 he was drafted low in the first. He was drafted wasn't a high draft pick in the first round. And many and, and many people said teams were going to regret it. The Lakers passed him over, and he scored twenty eight on LeBron. Um, but what's powerful about the story is that this kid, Nashawn um, Bones Highland, was a was a was an elementary and middle school kid in my school and was a good chess player. But he was a much better basketball player. Um, but you know, yeah, you know, he struggled as a teen and, and, um, and I, I was hard on him. We all were hard on him. He was a great ball player. We were hard on him. And, and there were just, there were some things that we just, um, we just didn't allow him to do. And we, we always thought that when he becomes the famous basketball player, he's not going to have anything to do you know, with us. This kid came back in high school to our school and he apologized to the teachers for how he behaved. And I, I've never seen a kid do this. <laughs> he actually apologized to the teachers. And then when he made his announcement in high school, he, he attended VCU, you know, for Kyle to play ball. He wore his middle school t-shirt. Didn't wear his high school. And the reporter said, why'd you wear your middle school shirt? He said, and I learned how to be, become a man in middle school. And that taught me a lot. Like this kid, we were so hard on this kid. But he never he never let that affect how he felt about the adults who impacted him. And then while in high school, his grandmother's house caught on fire. He had to jump from the second floor window. His grandmother passed away and his young cousin passed away in a fire. He jumped from the window, shattered his patella, had an operation. Doctors told him he probably never played ball again. Definitely not at, at that level where he was playing. He was a good high school basketball player. He came in our gym and rehabbed himself, worked out. Every day, rehab, rehab. He came back and in three straight games in high school, scored 50 points or more, Jimmy, and um, went on to become, you know, college phenom, uh, NBA, you know, drafted. And 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 he came to Philly to play um, this year. And the fire department, the guys that saved him, they came to the game and presented him with a fireman's jacket and just said that how proud they were. And we were all in tears. There, I mean, it was a big story on NBA.com. I mean, it's amazing. NPR, this story. This kid, and then he always pays respect to the firemen, pays respect. He, as a matter of fact, he called one of his former high school teachers to the locker room at to the Denver Nuggets locker room of the game. They didn't call me, but he called <laughs> former, he called his former high school teacher and mm -hmm. wanted to thank her for always believing in him. So I'm for all you educators out there, all you teachers and administrators, that kid who's walking around who you know is going to be a great athlete is going to be a great student, a great actor, entertainer, whoever. That student still needs you to be their teacher, their mentor, their role model, because we wanted to be hard on them now so it'll be easier on them later in life. And mm -hmm. that's the story. That's how they become resilient, Jimmy. And I, and I think uh, um, knowing it, it makes what I do now a lot easier because when I see these kids and I know I'm hard, I'm like, this kid's never going to love me. I know they will. They're, when they're older, they're going to realize that that the, the discipline was because of the love, and yeah. they'll come back and they'll 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 thank you for it. Okay, I'm gonna have to pause right now. Wipe this eye off, just a smidge in there. That was awesome. But and Google that, Jimmy. Google that story. Is I will. I'm going to. It's and it's a reminder, right, Salome, yeah. that it's the fact that that's why the power of relationships is so powerful because when you invest time in young people to really get to know them they know that you care about them you can be a little harder on them right and the fact that all of you reminded yourself look in the short term he may not be happy with us but in the long term it's going to pay dividends right for all of us and um and you should feel really good about that you and your staff so that's a great story and i will google that so i will reach out and hey, check that out so, powerful story powerful so salam this one's gonna be a little tough because again i mean you just mentioned there are hundreds and thousands of stories well i know there's also hundreds and thousands of stories man because you're not only an educator you're a poet but i do want you to take a moment and i one of the questions i had for you is for you to share with the audience a mantra or a quote 
that you try to model on a daily basis. And I'm actually going to let you share a couple of them if you have, them, because I have a feeling you have more than one, but I know the one that's on your website. I know the one that's, you know, you is, is your kind of your tagline that you often share that is a great, great mantra. Um, yeah. And, uh, but I'm going to let you talk about some of those quotes and mantras that you try to live by on a daily basis. Yeah. I, I wish your boy Joe was here. Cause you know, he, he inspires me to come up with new quotes because we, you know, he off, you know, I'm a big Sixers fan. You in the background, I got Moses Malone and Dr. J. He's a big Milwaukee Bucks fan. He's always putting down my Sixers, but he inspires me because he thinks he's a poet and doesn't know it. But, um, you know, with his little videos walking around and, you know, saying his rhymes and, you know, all this kind of stuff. But, um, well, as you know, my mantra is every child deserves somebody to be crazy about him. And I, I live by that. You know, every day I try to, you know, I try to make sure that there's a child somewhere who knows. And then adults as well. Those staff members who work for us need to know that their administrators are are cra crazy about them. Um, but, you know, I also end every session. I end every session. Five minutes, 55 minutes. I end every session with saying to folks, let's stop praying for a lighter load and start mm -hmm. praying for a stronger back. Because we know that this work won't get um, any easier. And um, but not saying that we don't work hard, but just saying that, but just want folks to know that we have to be prepared for this work because this work of a leader is 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 not one that is it's not for the weak, it's not for the for folks that are not courageous, and it's not for people who who who, who run from struggle. The, the price of leadership is conflict. So there's another one for you. You know, I, I'm full of them, Jimmy. You know, I'm, <laughs> I know that's what I said, buddy. We can do a whole show on this, you know that. I know that. I'm a part-time wannabe rapper, you know, but my, my students say I should stick to rapping gifts, but I, um, but, uh, but yeah, but those are, those are, you know, those are sort of just three of them. You know, the three, I, I also in our work, we want to be a blesser and not a stressor for our staff members. That's another one, you yeah. know, as well that, um, that I'm often, um, preaching, you know, for folks So just make sure that, that, that leadership is, is really about, uh, showing empathy. It's about understanding and patience, you know, and 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 being um, compassionate and passionate. You know, people talk about passionate leadership, but we need that compassion, you know, as well. And that's what that's what building a strong culture is about. You know, because culture rise is really all about making sure that you are taking care of those people, yep. you know, who are under your you know under your charge, the young ones, you know, and and you know, and the uh, and the old ones, and then making sure that you are a champion, you know, for, you know, for those people. So, and you can't do that if you're not leading with grace and love and patience, and empathy, and, you know, and, and understanding. So that, that, that's me. Every child deserves someone to be, you know, to be crazy about them and let's yeah. stop praying for a lighter load and start praying for a stronger back. Yeah. Well, I'm blessed, Salome, and I know that. And I know that the only reason, the only reason, that culturize has been successful as it has been successful is because you wrote the forward for it, my man. I mean, you got it off to a great start. I mean, once they read your part, they had to keep reading. For just, you know, it's the first time I ever heard you say that. Jimmy, <laughs> that book's been out 20 years and you're just saying it. I, I appreciate that. I have my little one, two page. I was waiting, Slum, I was waiting for the right moment with an audience. It doesn't matter if I just share it with one person. I want to share with a lot of people, buddy. So. No, that was awesome. I was, I still remember reaching out and I was just honored. I was just an awe. So I, I remember that. sitting down at dinner with you when you were taught, when you were conceptualizing this book, <laughs> talking about this book. And I'm saying, wow, this book, Jimmy doesn't realize this is going to be a big, this is going to be a big <laughs> book, man. When you were just talking about what just, what you wanted this book to mean to teachers and, and, and administrators and how just school culture, folks have to realize that if we really want to shift it's the monkey, you know, there's Todd Whitaker. Cause see, I'm I'm giving everybody a little props here today. <laughs> you know, that we've got to focus on, you know, shifting our our school school culture. Yeah. So um, you know, kudos to you and um everybody who's sort of in and and out. You know, we have a great network, you know, uh, uh of folks, Lavana, you know, I'm gonna shout out, you know, Lavana and all, you know, Rosa and all these other folks who are, you know, just always uh 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 star and you know we we've been on the road with some some amazing yeah. you know with some amazing guys but the women who we have these women leaders who we've been you know the women are the, they're the majority of our profession they hold they 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 have the highest degrees but yet they don't get these superintendent jobs the way men do 
And we know how talented they are, Jimmy, because we work with them. Mm -hmm. You know, because at, at the core of what we do, there are women basically running you know, our operations pretty much. Yep. So we know, and also we had great moms, great yep. moms who raised us and taught us you know the importance of um of always thinking about others and what we can do, you know, for others. So I, I'm you're blessed. I'm blessed. Thanks for having me. And um and 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 let's let's keep doing this work because there's a whole generation coming behind us, and um, and it's not it's not going to be an easy task for them to be able to uh, improve the system, but it has to get done. So we got to keep, we got to keep uh, pushing on. Well, I appreciate that, my friend. And most importantly, again, as I said before, is I'm so grateful that you continue to choose to stay in this profession because we need you and we need others like you to keep believing and to keep carrying uh, that heavy load and keep praying for that stronger back, my friend. So Thank you, my friend. God bless you. And again, thank you all for spending time with us today on the summer edition of the weekly show with Jimmy and Joe. A huge thank you to our special guest, Salome Thomas L. We would love it if you would subscribe to our YouTube channel at the weekly show with Jimmy and Joe or give us a like if you enjoyed today's show with Salome. And I don't know how you could not have just thought that was amazing. If you have a question or a problem of practice that you would like us to respond to, please email your question to us at the weekly show, Jimmy and Joe at gmail.com. We hope to see you again next time. Thank you so much. God bless.